All right, to all who are new here, welcome to Releve Sports Medicine's Virtual Journal Club. Due to COVID-19, we have moved our regularly scheduled in-person journal clubs to an online platform. Fortunately, our head of the journal club in liaison with the BOC, Brittany, has been working diligently to ensure that we are able to provide these educational opportunities smoothly. Last time I checked, we have over 500 athletic trainers registered for today's webinar. For additional webinar educational opportunities, you can visit our website and register directly for the webinar or sign up for the email list to be notified of upcoming webinars. We're constantly updating our schedules, so check back often. For all athletic trainers who are intending to get live CEUs from the BOC, immediately after the webinar, complete the quiz, which will become available once the webinar has finished. If you miss the quiz at the conclusion of the webinar, you will receive an email one hour after the webinar concludes, which includes the quiz along with the evaluation and the assessment. You have 24 hours to complete the quiz and the evaluation. Uh, this email, if you're looking for it, will come from customercarewebinar.com. Once the statement of credit is available for download from our website, you'll receive an email notification. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit the question and we will review the questions at the conclusion of the presentation. If you cannot see the PowerPoint slides and you're accessing the webinar from your mobile phone, swipe the screen to the left or possibly to the right, and the slides will become visible. I'm thrilled to host our speaker today. Dr. Rebecca Lopez is an athletic trainer at the University of South Florida and the director of the Post-Professional Graduate Athletic Training Program. She completed her doctorate program at the University of Connecticut with a dissertation on examining current controversies regarding hydration and athletics. She has served on the Medical and Science Advisory Board for the Corey Stringer Institute since 2010. So I'm going to go ahead and transition the presenter over to her screen and I will let her take it away. You should get a pop up here in a moment. Is that working? Perfect. Absolutely. Looks great. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that um, the opportunity to come speak to you all today. I had some technical is issues earlier, but I think we're, we're good to go now. So um, thank you so much. I, well, I need to figure out how to advance. Okay, cool. So conflicts of interest. Uh, I have no relevant financial conflicts of interest to disclose. I am, as mentioned, on the Corey Stringer's Institute Medical and Science Advisory Board member. I don't get any money for that. That's not a job at anybody, but I just want to put that out there. Um, the learning objectives for today will be uh, to identify the risk factors, and just like everything else with medicine, once you know the risk factors, you're able to better prevent it, uh, specifically to exertional heat stroke. Uh, the goal is to be able to differentiate the differential diagnoses between heat stroke and other conditions that might present similarly, uh, identify effective and practical cooling strategies and management, just overall prevention, recognition, and treatment of exertional heat stroke. So I want to start off by kind of addressing the Zach. Zachary Martin Act that is uh, about to take effect July 1st, uh, 2020. Uh, this is in Florida High School Athletics Association. Uh, so if you're outside of Florida, this may not be as relevant, but I know that a lot of states are, are looking at current policies for heat illness prevention and treatment. So uh, basically some of the things that are important to note, especially for those of you that are in Florida, is that it's looking to establish uh, guidelines for monitoring heat stress. There are a lot of states like Georgia, North Carolina, I believe Texas, um, that already use monitoring and environmental conditions to then make modifications to activity. So Florida is looking uh, to move in that direction. Um, heat stress must be determined by measuring ambient temperature, humidity, wind speed, and sun angle, which means WBGT as opposed to heat index. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And also requiring all schools that have an athletics program to have an emergency action plan um, that includes uh, cold water immersion, uh, or equivalent before transporting to hospital for cases of exertional heat stroke. So um, I like to go old school and bring it back to the physiology because I think the, the better we could understand what happens during heat stroke, the better we are prepared to both prevent it, recognize it, and treat it. Uh, when somebody is exercising the heat, you have this peripheral vasodilation, increased blood flow to the skin, uh, the sweating response, and increased heat loss, usually through evaporation. If it's very humid, we have to rely on Conduction, of, uh, conduction and convection. So if you picture somebody exercising, I'm gonna to skip to here, outside, uh, you could see how the environment a, plays a really strong role, which, why, which is one of the reasons why monitoring the environment could help decrease the risk if you're able to modify practices or exercise accordingly. 
So you can see this person running outside. You have the radiant heat, not only directly from the sun, but also reflecting off the surface area. So turf versus grass versus pavement um, all plays a role. And then you have things inside the body, right? So you have physiological differences, intrinsic factors that also could increase the risk as well as extrinsic factors, which I'll talk about in a second. So when you think about anybody exercising in the heat. I'm not talking about any specific heat illness or anything, but just anybody that's outside in the heat, if they have a fever, if they haven't slept, if they have low physical fitness, loss of acclimatization, um, overzealousness, trying to win over a, a playing spot uh, on the team, whatever the case may be, or trying to get their best PR on a race. And then you have extrinsic factors, which is more of the organ ad, the coaches, um, anybody who's pushing somebody to work harder, work to rest ratios, um, this is going to become very relevant. Um, I'm not sure if I have a pointer or not, but um, injured player or starting late. So right now we're in, this, in the case where we've all been home. Most people have been doing at-home workouts. I would imagine athletes have been trying to do something, but not the same. And then all of a sudden it's going to be like come out and, and you're able to go outside again. And, and that's going to be a, a really big key in terms of prevention of heat on us. And you know, the adding in of equipment, uniforms, the conditions, hydration access. I think it's also important to talk about the differences in the exertional heat illnesses. Sometimes we kind of just say heat illness, uh, but they're very different. They're caused by different things other than the common heat factor. The physiology behind the heat illnesses is actually quite different. Um, and therefore recognition and treatment is gonna be different as well. So when we talk about heat syncope, we're talking about somebody fainting, syncopal episode, usually lack of heat acclimatization, standing on spot for a long time and they faint. Um, exercise associated muscle cramps, also known as heat cramps, muscle fatigue, or uh, electrolyte imbalance. We're not going to get into that debate today. Um, just make sure that it's not sickle cell trait related. Um, heat exhaustion, the, the ones I really want to differentiate here are heat exhaustion and exertional heat stroke. Heat exhaustion is caused due to cardiovascular insufficiency, not enough blood pumping to get the cardiovascular exercise, to get the blood to the muscles that are working and that heat, that, that uh, blood flow to the periphery for that peripheral vasodilation for cooling. And as a result, eventually the person needs to stop because they're dehydrated, electrolyte imbalance. They might be a little bit warm, but they're not, um, their thermoregulatory system is not over overworking. Um, with the exertional heat stroke, uh, you have thermoregulatory dysfunction, very high uh, temperatures, um, and very dangerous hyperthermia with CNS dysfunction. So those are very different, but people tend to kind of group them together I think it's heat exhaustion, I'm gonna put them in the cold tub. Well, if they have cardiovascular insufficiency, dehydration, electrolyte balance, the cold tub might feel good, but it's not gonna really help what's going on. Um, somebody that has ex exertional heat stroke, they need to be cooled as soon as possible because they do have that hyperthermia. And again, the causes are a little different. So again, I'm gonna to focus today on exertional heat stroke, but also being able to differentiate between heat exhaustion, heat stroke, and some other differential diagnoses. Um, the most severe, Heat onus is exertional heat stroke. Of the ones I just mentioned, it's the, really the only one that somebody could die from, uh, defined by hyperthermia greater than 105 um, and central nervous system disturbances. Okay? Um, sometimes there's more, more, multi, multiple organ system failure, and that's I'll, I'll get into the pathophysiology in a second. But it is a result of that increased metabolic heat production, production in the body, environmental heat load, or unable to dissipate that heat. Um, so it's either excessive heat production and or inhibited heat loss. So when we look at the pathophysiology, um, um, here's where it's important to differentiate between com compensable and uh, uncompensable heat stress. So that top part of the graph above the red dot dashed line is compensable heat stress. That is just anybody, we're, I'm in Florida, you go outside to the car right now, it's borderline compensable heat stress, right? So you have the exercise heat stress, you have the intrinsic extrinsic factors, they're gonna increase the metabolic heat rate, um, an increase of uh, core temperature, increased cardiac output, increased blood flow to the periphery, uh, increased sweat response, that is a normal response. What happens is if it becomes uncompensable for various reasons, various intrinsic and extrinsic factors, you have that uh, decreased central venous pressure, a spike in the core body temperature, and as a result, it becomes uncompensable, you're not able to get rid of that heat, and a cascade of things happening at the cellular level. And that, that includes um, endotoxemia, energy depletion, cell death, uh, the blood brain barriers are broken, um, renal failure, liver dysfunction. And that's when you see somebody that goes to the hospital with heat stroke, 
they're in this organ failure for several days and then they die because they're not able to recover some of the things that happen um, with that increased core temperature that is not brought down soon enough. So with that being said, it's important to say that death from exertional heat stroke is preventable. Some people say heat stroke is preventable. I, I don't like to say that because I think there's always factors that we might not be able to control. However, when somebody is properly recognized as having heat stroke and cooled efficiently, efficiently there are zero deaths. So I have seen either myself personally and then worked with other groups of people that have treated hundreds of heat strokes with zero people dying. So why do they die? And I think this is important from an athletic training and clinician standpoint, they die due to mis misdiagnosis, either not having a temperature, and that's really important, um, or using an inaccurate temperature device. I'll talk about that at length. Um, no care or delay in care and treatment, inefficient cooling modality, also a really important thing that with the Zach Martin Act is gonna be helpful if there's a cold tub that's on site and ready to go. Um, immediate transport, and I think this one is extremely important. And the importance of differentiating between heat stroke and something else, another emergency, with any other emergency condition, you're going to call 911 and you're gonna send them to the hospital right away. With heat stroke, you're gonna call 911, but you wanna cool them on site. If you transport, if somebody collapses from heat stroke, you call 911 right away and you send them to a hospital, they might die because you sent them to the hospital too soon. So I think that's important um, to figure that out. Okay, so here's the first poll that I want you all to just answer very quickly. It's a two part in terms of prevention. So if you could go ahead and answer yes or no, and then the second part is if you answered yes. And then if everyone has had, I can't see. So if everyone's uh, had a chance to answer that, then we could uh, go to the next question, which is if you do track environmental conditions. So if you do currently track environmental conditions, which one uh, do you use? All right, I just want to get a, a basic understanding of what people are using so far. Perfect. I'm going to close here and then I'm going to share this with everyone. Okay. Okay, great. So looks like Weather App and uh, WBGT are the, the leaders here. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right, so let's talk about prevention here different, a lot of different factors here. And I think this is important uh, looking at the factors that cause heat imbalance and then factors that cause heat stroke, right? So very similar as you can see. Now, I think this is very important um, when we look at going back after COVID-19, I know some states are already returning um, in the next week or so, is if somebody has poor physical fitness, sleep deprivation, improper climatization, all those things are, are huge factors in exertional heat stroke. Um, and then looking at the extrinsic factors, heat and humidity, improper rehydration, exercise intensity, improper work to rest ratios, which is usually at the hands of the coaches, strength and conditioning coaches, sports coaches. Um, I know that coaches are probably dying a little bit inside during this whole time, just like a lot of people are. And as soon as they could get their athletes out there working, they're gonna try to push them hard and, and try to catch up for lost time. And that could be a very, very dangerous situation. So again, it's important to think about these things. Also, I will, Note, underlying illness, um, 
and medications that could affect somebody's ability to thermoregulate or just have somebody's temperature be a little bit higher than normal or if somebody has a fever. Those are huge, huge, huge risk factors for exertional heat stroke. Um, and I will add, um, I will add uh, one thing about that is, um, I forgot, <laughs> but um, uh, underlying illness is really important with, in terms of fever. So, oh, this is what I was gonna add, um, is I think I have a poll question for this, but we'll just skip it for now. Um, we'll, we'll move on to the next one later on. But the, the, the issue is this with exertional heat stroke. There's no one cause of exertional heat stroke. People don't get heat stroke because it's hot outside. They don't get heat stroke because they're not hydrated. Um, hydration seems to be the number one answer of why people get heat stroke, and it's not at all the case. Most of the time, it's a combination of anywhere between five and 15 factors of why somebody could get heat stroke. So somebody, if you think about going back, well, even without COVID-19, just August, preseason, end of July, improper heat acclimatization, if they're not physically fit, they didn't do anything over the summer, it's hot outside, the coach is pushing them, exercise intensity, work to rest ratio, physical effort unmatched to fitness level. They're not letting them have hydration breaks. And then you throw equipment on there. Perfect storm of things that would cause somebody's temperature to go up really high. So please think about that in terms of prevention. You could hydrate them all you want, but if all those other factors are there, they could still get heat stroke and be hydrated. So that's a really important thing to remember. Heat acclimatization is probably, in my opinion, one of the biggest impacts on preventing uh, heat stroke. And that's why you see people that get heat stroke on that first day or second day of of football practice of, or of any sport is if they're not heat acclimatized, there's a lot of physiological benefits to heat acclimatization. Um, I could talk, do a whole talk on heat acclimatization by itself, but I'll keep it to this one slide. The initial response of what happens um, when somebody starts exercising in the heat are our cardiovascular, decreased heart rate, increased plasma volume. Exertion is a big one too. You, you actually, it feels easier to exercise in the heat as you get to days four, five, and six. Then electrolyte, electrolytes get, uh, Decreased the amount of electrolytes lost through urine and sweat. So that's really important to keep that electrolyte balance as well. And then as you can see, your rectal temperature goes down, but it's not until days, you know, uh, six, seven, eight, right into week two, right as you're starting to add that equipment for some states that wait to the second week to add fo um, football equipment. And then another important thing that happens is you actually increase your sweat rate the more heat acclimatized you are. So if you could do anything in terms of controlling, I know this is a, a tall, tall order, controlling what your coaches do. Um, in some states, they have really great policies that don't let you do more things faster in terms of adding equipment, duration of practice, the time of day that they exercise. But if you could do anything in terms of educating coaches, it would be to help the gradual progression so that these changes actually take place before they get into the really high intense exercise with equipment. All right, so a, a big change for the Zach Martin Act is, is monitoring the environmental conditions. So this really does help decrease the risk if you're going to not just, it's not just monitoring it, but monitoring it with the intent of modifying the practices, modifying the activity. Um, there are a lot of high schools associations throughout different states that have implemented these. If you remember the, the paper in 2017 that ranked the state's associations by how many safety measures, a lot of people got really mad about that, but it really just kind of highlighted, hey, states, we're not doing enough the purpose of the, these people to be able to exercise these young athletes is to be safe um, and we need to have more safety measures in place. Um, so looking at that, how do clinicians or coaches retrieve environmental data out on the field? A lot of you put apps or WBGT. Um, I'm not endorsing any product at all. I don't care which one you get, but it's important that it measures the WBGT wet bulb globe temperature. And I'll, I'll explain that in a second. A lot of, oh, I saw a lot of old school sling psychrometers, if that's all you have, that's better than nothing, but it's limited because it's supposed to be done in the shade, heat index, um, and it doesn't include the radiant heat of the sun. So here are some of the things that you could do is based on the environmental conditions, modify practice time and duration, the amount of equipment worn, work to rest ratios should be modified, access to shaded areas. I've seen this work very, very well in some schools. I actually did a, a heat study with the football team last year and the athletic trainers even though it wasn't mandated, we're already monitoring WBGT. If it got above that 92 degrees uh, WBGT, they talked to the coach, the coach took it easy, the coach gave them more rest breaks, they brought the kids to the shade. Um, and this was without any mandates. This is just like good prevention measures based on, on the evidence. Um, so here you can see an example of North Carolina's uh, policy. Here they have WBGT or heat index. I think, again, the, the heat index is lacking radiant heat of the sun. And if you've ever, if you have a tent set up on your sideline, you know the difference between being in that nice shaded spot 
versus being in the middle of the field, especially if it's turf. So WBGT, the wet bulb globe temperature, takes in, into consideration the ambient, the humidity, and that radiant heat from the sun, um, as well as wind speed. So um, here you can see an example of some policies that uh, modify. So you can see at the bottom, if it's 90 or above in North Carolina, you suspend practice. I like the Georgia one um, because it says no outdoor workouts. And that's what happened at the school that I was at. If it was really intense, they just went inside the gym or that was chalk talk time um, or they went over film. Um, so they were practicing, they got what they had to do. And once the temperatures were too severe, they changed it to something else. They didn't cancel practice and just call it quits. Um, they just modified, it's a modification. So if it's over 92, not temperature, but WBGT, um, then in Georgia, you are to no outdoor workouts um, or delay it. So you could delay it if you know that the temperature is going to, it's like 6 p.m. and you're at 92. Hopefully not, but that actually happens. Um, and you could delay it a little bit so the sun goes down a little bit or you know it's going to get better. Um, so again, optimal measure for monitoring environmental conditions is wet bulb globe temperature. The heat index is recommended if WBGT is not available. However, if you're in Florida, the specific law that is about to take effect July 1st is specific to WBGT. So having a valid, reliable method is really important. Um, I would recommend that you, especially if you're in Florida or a state that mandates this, that you take a look at this article by Cooper. They did a validity study and they got different devices, different prices, and they compared the how reliable and how valid they were. All right, so uh, poll number two, I think. Uh, yeah, this is the one about recognition. If we could set that poll out, that would be wonderful. Uh, no, sorry. Can you do the next one? Um, it's talking about recognition of exertional heat stroke. Perfect. Thank you. All right. I just want to have a general idea. This is not supposed to be a trick question. It's supposed to allow you to pick two, but I see it says select one of the following. So um, I just want to have a, a basic understanding of, of where everyone is at right now in terms of recognition of heat stroke. Okay, awesome. So the correct answer should have been two things, and it should have been rectal temp greater than 105, so I'm happy to see 71%, and then central nervous system dysfunction. And I'll talk about the no sweat um, in a second. All right, thank you so much. All right, so let's talk about recognition. This is not part of the Zach Martin law specifically in terms of having to do a rectal temp. However, I will say the mandate to have cold water tubs and cool before transport is a little scary to me if you don't really know that it's heat stroke. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today. So the two main diagnostic criteria for exertional heat stroke, profound CNS dysfunction. It could be somebody's completely unconscious. It could be somebody is just kind of talking kind of nonsense. Uh, if you've had a, this is like, there's like 460 people. Everyone here has probably seen a concussion and had a patient that is kind of just just saying things that don't make sense and then kind of making sense and then not making sense. Um, that actually happens quite a bit with exertional heat stroke and then core body temperature greater than 105. Unfortunately, rectal temp is the only method of obtaining an immediate and accurate body temperature. Every other temperature device that you've seen out there, unless you're doing esophageal or the uh, ingestible thermistor pills, is not going to give you an accurate temperature with an exercising person. So I know a lot of you are doing temperature checks right now for COVID-19. Don't do rectal temp for that, totally fine. Uh, from a, a, a patient that is just walking in to get a temperature, tympanic, temporal, infrared, whatever, all those things, um, that's a debate for another talk. But when it comes to an exercising person and you're trying to rule in or rule out heat stroke, rectal temp is the only valid, accurate way to do that, okay? 
another very big misconception, which I saw about 11% uh, checked on that, is that somebody's not going to sweat. Okay, that was a trick answer to my question. Um, people are just exercising and they're sweating and they're running around in the heat. When they collapse, they may be sweating. They may be sweating a little bit less. They might not be sweating, but it's not an indicator and it's not a diagnostic tool for exertional heat stroke. I've treated a few heat stroke patients. They've all been sweating. To tell you the truth, I haven't noticed that they're not sweating um, because it's not a diagnostic criteria. So profound CNS dysfunction and core body temperature. There's a very big misconception about it. This was like a picture of a classic textbook of exertional heat stroke where it says hot, dry skin. This is absolutely incorrect. Uh, maybe of classic heat stroke, you think of an elderly person, um, a baby that's in a car or something, a classic heat stroke, somebody whose thermal regulatory system is not working and they're in a hot environment, they're not exercising, maybe those those people, their thermal regulatory system, Thermal regulatory system is not going to allow them to sweat in that situation, but you get a healthy indiv uh, individual that's exercising in the heat, they're definitely going to uh, be sweating, and using that to rule in or rule out uh, could be really dangerous. Um, okay, so what does heat stroke look like? In a clinical presentation, if you remember that uh, uncompensable heat stress, all those things are happening. You could see those top three are probably what you would see on site, right? They'll present with core body temperature greater than 105. CNS dysfunction could also be restlessness and irritability and aggressive behavior. That is also very common in heat stroke. The hyperventilation respiratory distress is another very key factor. Um, I believe it was the Jordan McNair case in Maryland where he was having respiratory issues. Um, and because of that, they didn't think heat stroke, they were thinking respiratory issues. Um, so it's a huge thing. Somebody could go into a seizure, difficulty breathing, and CNS dysfunction of some sort, and that's a, a big sign that it could be heat stroke. You don't know for sure though until you get the temperature. And then all those other things are, are that cascade of events that are happening at the cellular level, um, and that is what causes somebody to die, including explosive rhabdo um, due to all those things, and elevated liver enzymes is something that you would see on their uh, blood on their blood tests. So let's compare temperature devices. I really don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, it's important to know that the reason that rectal temp is the only one that is useful in this case is because the other ones are invalid. There have been numerous studies. I'll, I'm going to jump to this. Um, this is a medical tent of a running race, or like it's a foot race. Um, and I changed it to Fahrenheit because um, I know that's useful for most people um, in the U.S. Uh, you could see that in this, there's five subjects in this red box. The, the number, the first column is rectal temperature. The second column is oral, as in tympanic. So that first person had a temperature of almost 107, but the tympanic read 98. Um, that third person, 107, tympanic read 100. If I had somebody that was feeling not so great, kind of threw up during conditioning, um, kind of mumbling to me, not really making sense, and I took their tympanic temperature and it was 100, I probably wouldn't put them in the cold tub and I would probably think that something else is wrong with them. So this is why having that appropriate uh, temperature is and valid temperature is really important, okay? And some, some people want to just get a tympanic and add a number, but that, that doesn't always pan out at all. As you could see from this graph, if you can, it's kind of like all over the place, or even some temperature devices that as your core temperature goes up, the device goes down. If it's windy, if the person is not putting the temperature correctly in their ear, um, if you're using oral temperature and they just drank something, so many outside variables that could affect the temperature. So one of the things that I hear the most um, from clinicians that are, on not using rectal temp to diagnose or, or rule out heat stroke is that I will just cool them. If I think it's heat stroke, I'm just gonna put them in the tub. So this slide is very important and it basically explains why you can't just put somebody in the tub. First of all, is it heat stroke or is it not heat stroke? Um, as far as the differential diagnoses, I've heard of athletic trainers that thought it was heat stroke and it ended up being a ruptured spleen, uh, thought it was heat stroke and it was diabetes, uh, thought it was something else, sent them to the hospital and it was heat stroke. Um, and again, because you're cooling on site for heat stroke and ruptured spleen, you are not cooling them on site. You're sending them as soon as possible. It could be very, very dangerous game to play to say, I think it's heat stroke. I, I, I had some students that saw a, a, it was a soccer camp. They were carrying this child into the cold tub because he had passed out and he was kind of in and out of consciousness. And they're like, it looks like heat stroke. We're going to put him in the tub. 
just then the parent comes in and says he's diabetic. If they had delayed transport and put him in a cold tub because they thought it was heat stroke, they would have been in, in, in a lot of trouble. So luckily the parent was there to explain that. So you want to get a core temperature to know, is it or is it not heat stroke? Another important thing is you could call 911, you put him in the cold tub, and then EMS arrives. You get the rectal temp, they're at 107. EMS arrives, they're at 106.5. You should cool them on site, keep them in the tub until at minimum 105, okay? But if you don't have a temperature and you just cool them, EMS arrives very quickly and they take them out of the cold tub, uh, they're going to have a lot of complications if they don't die. And that happened in a case in Towson University where the football player, the athletic trainer was like a suspected heat stroke, put him in the tub, EMS arrived, they took him. He had organ transplants, he had multiple like 11 plus surgeries and and wasn't able to play football after that. Uh, if they had gotten a core temperature and they were able to monitor them, they would have been able to, to decide we can't get transported yet. We need to cool him first before he gets sent off. So it's very, very important to have, if you're going to do cooling and you're going to have a cold tub available on site, you need to have an athletic trainer there that's going to be able to get a temperature and verify that it is in fact heat stroke. So these are some of the differential diagnoses. I won't spend too much time because I already kind of mentioned on it. Uh, but I do want to include this table here. Heat exhaustion and heat stroke can be very similar. I've had cases of a heat exhaustion where person's kind of in and out, they're dizzy, they're throwing up, they look really pale, they look like they're kind of pass out, and it's very similar. So if you look at the recognition aspect, hot skin, sweating, unable to exercise, vomiting, the only difference between these two is the temperature uh, for heat stroke is going to be greater than 104, 105. And this table, I won't get too far because I know it's too uh, small, but you can see all the conditions on the top and all the symptoms, signs and symptoms on the left. There's so many, there's so much overlap with the symptoms on these conditions, but the only one that will have an elevated core body temperature is exertional heat stroke. You're gonna, not gonna have exertion greater than 105 uh, for heat syncope, for head injury, for cardiac, for respiratory, for heat exhaustion. None of those are gonna have a core temperature 106, 106. 107, only heat stroke. So that core temperature is really, really, really important. Uh, so thermometer versus thermistor, it's best to have a thermistor because you could insert it. And then if it's heat stroke, you put them in the cold tub. If you have a long enough thermistor, you keep it in them, in them while they're cooling them and you could monitor their cooling. Um, if you have a thermometer, any thermometer, uh, like just a cheap, actually I have a picture here, um, regular thermometer, you could insert it, see that it's heat stroke, then you have to take it out put them in the cold tub and then monitor them every five minutes or so, which is doable. Um, so a lot of athletic trainers say my, my administration won't buy a thermistor for me. And I totally understand that a thermistor is better than a thermometer, but you can use a thermometer. Um, you just have to reinsert and check their temperature a few times as opposed to inserting it and leaving it in there during the cooling. So um, kind of go through this uh, quickly. These are the steps of how to do it. Um, I could definitely, after this, if anybody has questions, feel free to reach out. I want to make sure that we have question, enough time for questions at the end, but it's a step-by-step -step of how to do it. Uh, the Corey Stringer Institute also has a similar step-by-step -step thing on their website um, that you could check out. And again, you would insert 10 to 15 centimeters, about four to six inches. You want to make sure that you, um, this picture is not showing gloves, but you would wear gloves, uh, use some kind of uh, lubricant, and then uh, insert 10 to 15 centimeters. You could put a mark on your probe so that you know what that is so that in, when it's go time, you're not worried about how long and you just have a mark to insert it. Um, again, if you have questions about this after, I'll be happy to answer that. I just wanted to include this because um, the one on the left is one that's very popular by athletic, athletic trainers, about 300 bucks. The one in the bottom, the gray one, is one that I've used in the laboratory setting, a little bit pricier. Disposable probes for the one on the left. Uh, reusable probes for the one in the bottom, the $700 one, but you could also go just go to the drugstore and and buy a, a cheap and just toss it. I would I would not bother cleaning that one. Okay, um, you could look at other funding sources like administration booster clubs. Um, take some tape out and get something that's going to um, add add a, a, ther a thermometer or thermistor that's going to save somebody's life. All right, next polling question is on the treatment of exertional heat stroke. Um, you know what? I'm going to skip the poll uh, for the sake of time. It was basically asking what's the gold standard of treatment, but I'm just going to tell you what it is. It's cold water immersion. All right, so let's look at the treatment. Initial treatment must be on site. Again, this is something that if you're in Florida, the Zach Martin law um, is asking 
based on environmental conditions to have a cold tub available or similar uh, ready to go. So the whole goal of cooling on site is because there's a critical threshold. The longer somebody's temperature is above 105 is when that organ damage and cell death starts to occur. So the longer, it's more of a time factor than it is how high your temperature got. So it doesn't matter if your temperature got to 106.5 or forgot to 108. The longer that it's above 105, the worse the outcome, okay? So the goal is to decrease that body temperature as soon as possible via cold water immersion. If you don't have a cold tub, uh, then a tarp that you could kind of convert into a cold tub if you have a pool on site, anything that would you could immerse somebody in, okay? And the picture that you see here is at Falmouth Road Race. They do an excellent job of treating a bunch of heat strokes every year. Uh, unfortunately, it was canceled this year. It's in August. Um, here, This was last year, last August. You could see that we're cooling this patient and they're at 107.5. And this person was actually back and forth talking to me and then wouldn't make sense and then wanted to see her temperature and then wanted to take a picture of herself with the temperature um, and then wouldn't make sense. So her CNS dysfunction was kind of back and forth even at 107.5. Okay, so cool first, transport second. Again, you want to get that diagnosis to make sure it's heat stroke before you delay somebody being transported to the hospital. But if it is heat stroke, you absolutely want to decrease their temperature to at least 105, ideally 102.5. Um, so here you could see uh, that dotted line um, is a critical level of 105. The longer somebody stays above that dotted line, the worse the prognosis, organ damage, organ transplant, and death. I'll quickly talk about this case is that the Marine Corps Marathon is actually a, a published as a case study um, in the current sports medicine reports 2016. This is a race where if you listen to Dr. O'Connor's talk uh, last week, uh, he uh, mentioned Marine Corps Marathon and showed how they cooled them with dousing them with cold water. So the person in the blue collapsed close to the finish line, was taken to the medical tent and we cooled him. His temperature was 108. And you could see that with the cooling, we were able to get his temperature down within 30 minutes. That's kind of the goal is to get that temperature down below 105, if not back to 102-ish um, within 30 minutes. The one in the red collapsed in another part of the course, and unfortunately he was taken directly by ambulance to the hospital. So collapsed, ambulance, hospital. The blue person, or the person in the blue that was taken to a medical tent, they were both actually um, in the Marines, um, survived, he went to the hospital, he was released, no complications, re returned to active duty. The one in the red also survived, they thought he was gonna to have to have a liver transplant. He became heat intolerant and was discharged. He was not able to continue his service in the military. And he was, he collapsed, picked up by an ambulance and taken directly to a hospital. But he was not cooled as quickly. So how do you prep for this? Have a prep, a kiddie pool, tarp, cold tub, or pool inside the athletic training room, um, whatever it is, ready to go. You, you don't have to have it filled with ice and water because if you're anywhere that it's hot outside, it's gonna melt immediately, but you could have the coolers, ice chest ready to go, um, a blanket or large towel to place under their arms and something uh, to stir water. I always like to say an athletic training student, um, but if you don't have one of those, um, just stir the water uh, with your arm or a, whatever you use to stir the Gatorade or whatever you can. You just have to continuously move that water around. That really helps increase the cooling rate. If you don't have that, tarp or taco method is a way to go, followed by ice towels, ice water, and dousing. Locker room, if your water comes out cold in the locker room and that's the best you can, then put them in there. You can maybe even put a tarp inside there and have them sit in the tarp or carry them into the tarp. So let's talk about the cooling rates because this is important. Um, here is that critical threshold. Sorry, this is a cooling rate. Ideally, you're at 0.15 degrees Celsius or faster. All the way on the right, you have different degrees of cold and ice water immersion. You want them to cool as fast as possible. There has been two TACO studies or TARP assisted studies that you can see are pretty much teetering on the line of, of um, good enough cooling rate. Cold water, ice water immersion is better. Ice packs over peripheral arteries are terrible. Um, they, it's almost the same as doing nothing. Uh, so I know a lot of us, myself included, were taught always ice packs over peripheral arteries. That really doesn't do anything unless you have continuous water dousing and water movement and ice um, flowing all over the body. All right, so cool first, transport second, remove the cold, remove them from the cold water when they're about 102.5, they will continue to cool after that. The problem if you don't have a rectal temp and you don't know their actual temperature is that uh, some people could cool 
that amount in 15 minutes. Some people might take 40 minutes. Um, it really depends. Sometimes when you put somebody um, in the cold tub right away, uh, their temperature actually is continuing to increase and you'll see their temperature go up while they're in a cold tub full of ice and water before it actually comes down. So you stir water, you continue with what you're doing, trust that it's gonna work and you'll see that eventually their temperature is gonna go down. But if you don't have a temperature assessment, uh, you're not able to get their rectal temp and know where they're at. You don't know if it's still going up when EMS gets there. You don't know if it's still at 108 when EMS gets there. Um, or you don't even know if it's heat stroke. So um, that's really important to remember. So here you can see uh, they have a blanket towel under their arms to keep their head out of the water, assess temperature, always call 911. I've, I've never told anybody not to call 911. You just want to delay transport until their body temperature is at least 105 and on the way down uh, to cooling, ideally 102.5. Okay, um, one thing I'll add here is CNS dysfunction. Very common for somebody with heat stroke to be combative, um, you might need to get help from somebody to help keep them in the cold tub. Many, especially at Falmouth Road Race the last couple of years, people have gotten kicked, people have gotten punched. Um, just know that this is something that needs to come up at your coach's meeting when you're talking about your policy, you're going over your EAP is, if I get somebody in the cold tub and they start fighting us, you just know that that's pretty normal behavior and I need your help to help me keep them in the cold tub because they don't know what's happening. Um, so you could try talk to, talk, talking to them rationally, but sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But just know that, get help, um, make sure you're not doing this alone and do your best to cool them um, and get their body temperature down. So this is a basic paradigm. I would strongly encourage you to look at the this consensus, consensus statement from 2018, looking at pre-hospital care of exertional heat stroke. Rapid recognition and assessment. So somebody collapses, or you're not sure what's wrong. Getting that rectal temp to confirm the diagnosis, cooling on site prior to transport, and then sending them for emergency care. Uh, we had a cross country runner in one of the local sc schools here in Tampa, our athletic trainer. Uh, she collapsed on the finish line of a cross country meet in October. Um, saw that she was kind of not acting normal, assessed her. She was at 106.9, I think, or 106.5. Put her in the cold tub, monitoring, took her out. EMS arrived like 15 minutes later and she was already out and okay, but she transported her. So even if they seem okay, transport, get that advanced um, healthcare. Um, advanced medical care, and then just make sure that you get documentation on their blood levels and see that it's okay for their for return to play. That's another case. If you have questions about that, you can certainly answer that. This is also there an algorithm that you could include even in your heat policy. You could put this figure from this consensus statement and say, this is what we're gonna do. Um, I won't go into it, but very briefly, assess responsiveness. If their CNS is not normal, get a, get a rectal temp, Rectal temp is greater than 40.5, cooling, transport to advanced care. But it's really easy to, to incorporate this into a heat policy. So let's say you don't have the $150 for a cold tub. You could get a kiddie pool. You could get a tarp for 5 or $10. Locker room shower, if you could guarantee that the water coming out of there is going to be cold. Um, but again, kiddie pool, 20, 30 bucks. The plastic one might be better. Um, they also have the cold tubs that are shorter for like smaller athletes. So if you don't, maybe you don't have football, but you have a lot of runners and, and other sports in the fall that are smaller athletes, you could probably be fine with a much smaller uh, tub. So let's talk about the elephant in the room, and that is legal concerns. All right, a lot of athletic trainers are worried about the legal ramifications of using a rectal temp, especially on a minor. I will tell you this much, you're in a much more liable if you don't follow best practices than if you do follow best practices. So this is kind of personal communication experts in with heat stroke that have kind of talked to each other about this stuff. Um, I got this figure from Dr. Jurgen in University of South Carolina. Thank you for that. Um, so here you can see 80 percent, uh, oh, sorry, zero percent of ATs that use a rectal temp have been involved in court cases, 80 percent for those that have not been used. And the other 20 percent is case of heat stroke where there wasn't an athletic trainer there, okay? So we know of a lot more athletic trainers that have gotten sued or in legal trouble because they didn't get a rectal temp because they transported them right away. They put ice packs over peripheral arteries and didn't cool them using cold water immersion. So it would be your, to your best benefit to talk to everybody um, in your group and work to make these changes so that you actually are safer in terms of a legal standpoint than if you don't follow best practice. Um, and I'll just, this is from the National Center for Catastrophic Sports Injury Research. They kind of, they put different cases of all the reasons that catastrophic injuries and death. 
I don't want anybody to be this last this last case right here. Oops, um, where uh, this 16-year-old football player was immediately attended to by an athletic trainer, and when he got to the hospital, his temperature was 108. No athlete that collapses from heat stroke with a temperature of 108 should be sent to the hospital at 108. Always cool them on site. Do whatever you can. If EMS is already there, uh, if you have a rectal temp, you could show them this person is at 108. We need to cool them on site. If you have conversations with them beforehand, you have policies in place. It's all been discussed. It becomes a lot easier than trying to fight in that situation. So again, educate everybody, starting with your supervising physician. You need them to be on board to approve your policies. Coaches, athletes, ADs, parents, um, talk to them about all these things, about your cool first transport, about modifying activity based on the environment, about getting rectal temps, especially if you're on your own, you're an athletic trainer at a high school and you work on your own, you're, uh, the only other adults around are coaches, somebody collapses during conditioning, you're going to need that coach to come in to come with you and help you and not, and not be have you be the only adult there getting a rectal temp on a minor. So there are some things that need to be considered and discussed, uh, but absolutely can be done and has been done many, many times in our group here at USF, our outreach. We have athletic trainers that have gotten rectal temps multiple times in the last 10 years that I've been here. Um, I think only one of them was heat stroke. Many of the other times they used it to rule out heat stroke, zero liability, zero issues with it. Parents were so thankful after. So keep that in mind that people don't want, they don't want their kids to die, right? And the coaches don't want any issues. So education is really, really important when it comes to these topics. Documentation, have everything written, know your state practice act, um, create policies, have a written policy, share your policy with everybody, just like your EAP, you have an EAP, follow that EAP, and then notify everybody and kind of go through it um, so that everybody's aware. Because what you want is, if hopefully this doesn't happen, but if somebody does collapse with, collapse with exertional heat stroke and you're there, you want it to be as smooth as smooth as you can for an emergency. It's usually not smooth, but you want it to be kind of, everybody knows what their role is and, and what, what's gonna happen, and you kind of all work together on that. Um, the NATA does have this heat stroke authorization form where the athletic director or supervisor signs and could circle um, either determine core body temperature or not to determine. Basically, they're, you're asking a non-medical person to give you permission to follow best practice. I'm not saying the form is bad. I'm just saying it's not ideal. So what some people have done is actually change this instead of saying heat stroke treatment authorization to say heat stroke um, acknowledge, acknowledgement form. So you go to your athletic director and it says, this is my policy. I'm going to get a rectal temp if I suspect heat stroke. I'm going to cool them on site um, before transport um, if it is heat stroke. And then they sign it saying they acknowledge that that's your policy. They might not like it, but um, I, I sincerely feel that somebody that does not have a medical background, whether it's a school board or the AD or the principal should be telling a healthcare professional to not follow best practice. So whatever case may be, whichever form is gonna work best for your location, just make sure that you document it and you and you have all, all your ducks, ducks, ducks in a row. Um, this video is good for coaches. Um, I definitely not gonna play it, it's nine and a half minutes long, but it basically shows how to put somebody in a tarp and how to put somebody in a cold water immersion tub. Uh, you can't be in all places at the same time, so it's an excellent video to show your coaches. So say you're away with a different team and your coaches are doing some kind of conditioning or whatever the case may be, something happens and you're not there, they could use cold water immersion to cool somebody. I absolutely would never, ever, ever recommend a coach getting a rectal temp, and I also wouldn't recommend a coach delaying transport um, if you're not around because they're not medical professionals and they can't make that judgment call. So if somebody collapses, they think there's heat stroke, they absolutely can put them in the cold tub, wait till the ambulance gets there and send them on their way and hope for the best. But I would never recommend that A, a coach does a rectal temp or that B, a coach delays transport. Um, you don't, we don't need coaches diagnosing and deciding whether somebody has heat stroke or not, but it is excellent to have a cold tub ready to go. If a half flight trainer is not on site, they could put them in the cold tub while they wait for EMS. All right, so I think, Kind of wrap it up here. Um, want to dispel myths about e EHS. Again, the patient is still sweating, so it's not heat stroke. That's a, a misconception. A heat stroke patient will still be will be unconscious. That not not necessarily true. They could be combative. They could be talking to you. Um, it's important to know that heat illnesses don't occur in a continuum. So you don't just get heat exhaustion and then heat stroke. Different pathology, different causes altogether. 
Um, you don't want to call EMS and send them right away. You want to call them on site. Um, the big myth is that outside trainers will get sued if they obtain a rectal temp, especially with a minor, and that's not true at, at all. If you're suspecting heat stroke and you get a rectal temp and it's not heat stroke, you move on to your differential diagnosis, okay? It's not like you did something horribly wrong. If they had symptoms that looked like heat stroke and it's not heat stroke, good. Now you know it's not heat stroke and you can move on to something else. And the last one I think is really important. Uh, a lot of people think if I suspect heat stroke, I just cool them with, with the treatment is not going to be different. And that's absolutely not true because A, it could be something else and B, um, you could transport them too soon if you don't know what their temperature is. So again, educate, um, incorporate these into your clinical practice, incorporate them to all your documentation and EAP, seek advice from experts, um, share your plan. And I would just want to say that it's 100% survivable when applying the best evidence. Zero people have died from heat stroke um, in those situations. And I think with that, I will end for questions. All right, thank you so much. This was great. We have already a lot of questions uh, coming up here. Um, and okay. so I'm just going to start kind of running through those and we'll get to as many as we can. Okay. In terms of what, what have you guys been talking about in your county or at your university in regards to the duration of acclimatization? Are you, are you expecting that to be any different um, at this time with, with all of the athletes not necessarily participating in things during COVID? Yeah, I mean, the general rule is 10 to, 10 to 14 days for heat acclimatization. Uh, most policies are much shorter than that. It's like five days, it's like three days in helmets and then shoulder pads. Um, you have to take into account the physical fitness aspect. So if those kids, if you could guarantee that they've been working out, they've been running on their own and they're fit, it'll be shorter. But there's such a strong cardiovascular component and fitness component to that, that if they're super out of shape, you just gotta prolong it, even if it's just more frequently, but shorter duration and gradually building up that intensity. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely agree with you in terms of the, with the acclimatization, you're, they may be able to get acclimatized, but they still certainly may not have their cardiovascular fitness back right at 14 day mark. Um, right. For, for a lot of these folks who are just sitting at home right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Now, do you happen to know um, policing for in regards to the adherence to the Zach Martin Act? And and that's uh, oh, who who is going out? Let's say we have a lot of of schools that maybe at the secondary school level that don't have athletic trainers. Who's who's maybe ensuring that that's? I I don't know. I, what I do know is that I think their their last board meeting had to get canceled. And so I think they're, I believe they're meeting in June and setting up the policy for that. So anybody in Florida should look out for the FHSA website and see when they are, the board is meeting and what that policy is gonna look like. Um, I would imagine it would be similar to any other enforcement of, you know, coaches are supposed to practice with the athletes till a certain day and you're not allowed to use equipment till a certain day. Um, the worst case scenario is if something really bad happens and you didn't follow the policy, those schools are going to be in, in a lot of trouble, but I don't know who would be policing that on a regular basis. Yeah, that's, I, I thought it was a great question. I, and, and I was kind of speculating that between the athletic directors to the county athletic director, right. they are going to be involved with that as well. Um, yeah, and without it, without an athletic trainer, the, the school is going to have to decide who is going to be, for example, taking the measurements and the communication of that is very important. So one person checks WBGT on a regular basis and they have to have some kind of group text or something to notify, hey, we're in the whatever zone, you have to make these modifications. So each school is going to have to come up with a plan that's going to work for them, whether they have an athletic trainer or not. Yeah. Well, and you know, uh, kind of going off of that, you're talking about the um, WBGT uh, measurements. What what do you guys typically use? I mean, I know Florida, we've got, we've got high humidity, which is the biggest impact um, for those measurements. And, and, you know, we've got kids who have dealt with exertional rhabdo in the past. They're going to be more apt to, to you know, developing cramping and they're looking at, at, at you and us and <laughs> everybody else trying to figure out how to prevent it. How, how do you approach your um, modification of practice and modification of games? Right. So I, I really like the Georgia policy and I've talked to a climatologist before and they, they really believe that the, the climate here in Florida is very similar to Georgia. I know that FHSA is going to be looking at that and using Georgia's policy as a guide, but it, I mean, I saw it being enacted in a school here in Tampa without a mandate and it was 
you know, the athletic trainer was using that 92 WBDT or higher as far as no outdoor. And then anything really close to it was like 91. Um, they were just giving more rest breaks. Uh, they had a shaded spot. If they didn't, they would go into the locker room for a little bit and then come back out, just give them some time to kind of cool down a little bit. Um, so I would approach it very similarly to how Georgia did it, actually. I think they did a good job with that. And it, there was a lot of research that was done to come up with that policy. It wasn't just people saying like, oh, that's just, you know, it was a lot of research and climate research that was used to put that together. So I think that's a good starting spot. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I know it, I work I work with one of the NAIA universities and and we've we've had a lot of few issues. And and so one of the things that we kind of got from that is if we actually made a, a lower number. We use 73 as the number when we notify coaches and we actually reschedule at 82. Um, now, what about what about so if you're if you're going to measure it, are you are you including turf temperatures? Yeah, so if you have a turf, it's going to be tougher because you're probably going to have more activity that's going to be modified and or canceled on that. Um, the school that I was at for that research study I did last August was fortunate that they had a turf and a grass field. So if they checked it on the too high, they'd go in the grass field. I mean, you could go softball field, baseball field, somewhere that there's grass if you only have a turf football, but it's it's anywhere. So the, the turf temperature is actually going to be the radiant heat on that thing is going to be so much higher that it's going to put you in the no no exercise most of the time in, in preseason for sure in florida and anywhere else in the southeast and when when you use your device are you walking out to the middle of the field you're standing there for a duration of time do you do you have a set protocol that you use if you're going to be measuring the wbgt it, it needs to be on the same playing surface, but it doesn't have to be on the playing surface. So it could be on the sideline. So I think sideline, as long as it's not, you know, if there's a tree and you're in the shade, it's going to be totally off. So on the sideline, on the same playing surface. So if there's turf, you know, they usually have a pretty significant sideline. You put it on there um, and you, you leave it there the whole time. If you have a tripod, most of them stand on a tripod or you could have it around your neck if it's a lanyard. Um, and just continuously monitoring at least at the minimum 30 minutes for every hour. And you could see like if it's trending up and you're at like 91, you probably mm -hmm. want to check it more frequently. You don't want to say, well, I don't have to check it for another hour. You know, you want to check it and make those modifications. And, and if you know that it's close, but the sun's going down, then you know that you might not have to check it as often. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and, and even start, start communicating to the coaches so it doesn't come as like a, hey, surprise, right. you know, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> they want to be able to like get some things in or maybe have a plan of where they want to if they want to cancel if they want to head to the gym so yeah communication of like a heads up is, is usually really helpful awesome now what about so so there was a lot of questions about the um disposable thermometer saying okay look this is this is a resource that we have available what would be the best practices for utilization of a disposable thermometer you you've got a kid that goes down what would be kind of your approach in terms of utilizing one? Yeah, so um, what what we have done here is we've trained people. They've gone through like a similar training, except hands-on with like a, a model. Uh, but if you don't have that, it's the actual part part of inserting the rectal probe is really easy. You have to find the, the, the you know, you find the anatomy, you know where it is. Um, that's the easy part. So um, having it available at, at whenever there's a risk um, somebody goes down, you could either move them to your medical tent, move them to the athletic training room, or just like if you had like a severe ortho injury that you would clear everybody out of the way, you could clear everybody, even if it's in the middle of the field. Nobody has to see anybody. Um, I didn't get to get the specifics, but we usually have a large towel or blanket that you could drape over the patient. So literally the only person that is involved is the person inserting the rectal tent. Nobody, even the person holding the blanket could be facing away and doesn't have to see anybody. So the patient, the patient privacy. Um, is really important and then you get the temp that way it's very the process of getting the temp is very quick especially with the thermistor you, if you lower the pants insert it bring the pants back up it's like 10 15 seconds um and once it's in it's in and then you can move to the to the next step so let's say let's say someone has an elevated temperature and you say okay let's activate our our protocol we're you know we're going to treat this person as as exertional heat stroke and they are and that's that's your tool to measure their temperatures how how do, how would you approach that with a disposable thermometer um i guess i'm not sure i understand the question just using the, the probe is the probe is it's only the probe that's disposable so you you attach the probe to the 
to the device. And then once you're done with that one, you just throw that out. And the devices that I've seen come usually with like four or five disposable mm -hmm. ones. And then you could order more, like just to supplement um, and use it with the same device. Right. And then, and so, so you go ahead, you get, you get your uh, athlete into a cold tub. Now, do you, is, has your approach been to remove them from the cold tub to remeasure yeah. her temperature? To, because oh, you're disposable, it's not necessarily waterproof. It is, it is. The one that I'm talking about is, um, and I should have brought, it's in the next room over, but basically the device can't get wet, but the disposable probe can. So they could be in the water with the probe on it the whole time. If you use a regular thermometer, like the store-bought one, you have to take them out of the water, check it again, and then put them back in. So every five minutes is what I would recommend. Like if you get a temperature and they're like 107, 108, put them in the tub, take it out, put them in the tub. That's what like the handheld, the regular thermometer one. Is that what you're asking? Not the thermistor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that actually the process of, of treating them then. Um, yeah. And and you know I wonder if so so what I've what I've been doing and what I've been taught is is once you are identifying this is what it is um, you're expecting a one degree drop every five minutes but once you once you're submerging them into the into the ice baths that they're gonna be there for at least twenty minutes is that something that that you guys utilize you know you you get the opportunity you have a, a constant um, temperature going. Mm -hmm you're monitoring exactly what numbers they're at. Yeah, so it's an average. So it's one degree uh, Fahrenheit uh, every three minutes or one degree Celsius every five minutes. Um, so depending on which one you're using. Um, so yeah, if you have that, it, it's an average though. So initially their temperature might go up. Um, and then usually when it starts to come down, it comes down a little bit faster, but on average it's one degree Fahrenheit for every three minutes. So if you know you have to drop it from like 106 to 102, you know, four times three, that's what you average 12 minutes, but then it just depends. It's so individualized. We've gotten people that cross country runner was in and out of the tub in 15 minutes and she was at 106.9. Um, we've had people over 30 minutes and still like 107 and it won't budge. It just stays there. So um, that's why having the temperature is so important to guide the, the treatment. Well, good. Well, great. We are, we are certainly at time at this point. Thank you so much uh, for speaking today. Uh, any last sure. comments? No, I, I just want to wish everybody good luck and be safe out there. I know it's going to be some trying times and uh, the heat is going to just be an added stress factor there. So if anybody has any questions or wants to reach out to me, um, I think that last slide had my email. Feel free to, to reach out and I'm, I'm happy to help. Awesome. All right. We'll see you all next week. We have Dr. Dugas of the Andrews Institute talking about the UCL primary repair uh, next week. Have a good week, everyone.